Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum. This is being filmed on Wednesday, October the 23rd. Um, the first thing we're going to be talking about today is one of the most important events, I think, of the last century. We're about one month before the 50th anniversary now of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Um, I was in school when it happened. I still remember where I was at that moment. Um, I didn't realize what a tragedy it was. I, I of course, believed the official story at the time um, that a, a crazed lone gunman had, had shot John F. Kennedy. I don't believe that anymore. Now I firmly believe that Mr. Kennedy was assassinated by a power structure that most of us don't even know about, but which clearly seems to exist. Why was Kennedy assassinated? I think it was because he wouldn't do what he was being told to do. Um, the CIA tried to invade Cuba at the time in, in around 1962. Kennedy refused to support it with, air, with American air power. And he later fired the head of the CIA, who was, I think, uh, Mr. Dulles, John Foster Dulles, or, or his brother, I can't remember which one, fired the head of the CIA. He wanted to make peace or at least get rid of nuclear weapons with the Soviet Union. He wanted closer relationship. He did not want to get into Vietnam, that horrible war which cost millions of people their lives. He wanted to get out of that. And maybe the worst thing he wanted to do was he wanted to start to use the U.S. Treasury, the U.S. government, to create its own money instead of borrowing from the private banks as they do and as we do and is one of the main reasons why our nations are so deeply in debt. Kennedy was a great president in my estimation. Now as we run forward uh, to the anniversary, watch what the corporate owned media tells you about Mr. Kennedy. It's going to be a lot about women, a lot about Camelot, a lot about, you know, they don't like Kennedy because of all these great things he was trying to do. So everybody should keep an eye on that over the next month. Uh, we're very lucky we've got a, uh, Walter and I have a, uh, have a guest who uh, knows a lot about the field of intelligence, uh, central intelligence, that kind of thing, uh, Andrew Hunter. Andrew, thank you very much for, for coming on. Thank you, Jack. Yes, um, I'm, and as ho hopefully most of our viewers uh, will remember what they were doing on November 22nd, 1963, many questions still still remain in terms of who actually was involved and uh, what countries did they come from. Now, in, in the course of my research over the last 25 years, uh, I have discovered, um, not mo mo mostly to my amazement, of the intense Canadian connection in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Now, in, in setting the table for, you know, how did we get there and what, would, what were we bringing to the table, um, as soon as uh, the end of the Second World War, um, the Canadians were involved in intelligence, both industrial and government intelligence. So we were the natural ones to be involved in both the logistics and the actual, uh, you know, the, the implementation of the assassination of JFK. So you mentioned when we were talking earlier about uh, Mr. Stevenson, who I'm sure most Canadians have never heard about, but I remember his name because there was a book or a movie the man called Intrepid. I remember that, but who Mr. Stevenson was uh, and his role in any of this, I have no idea. So fill us in. Well, in the, in the international intelligence community, there's probably only one person who could, be, uh, who could be labeled or named as a super spy. In other words, the, 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 the most elite of all the spies and intelligence op operatives in the world. And Sir William Stevenson definitely, as a Canadian, was the number one man. Now, when the plans were put together for the logistics on the execution of JFK, there were many intelligence agencies involved from both Europe and North America. So the Canadian side was called in uh, to, to provide the logistics as well as the supervision of the act. And the two Canadians that we, uh, we want to remember as being involved in this are Sir William Stevenson, also known as codename Intrepid. He was the major quarterback, in other words, the man in ground central basically running and, and signing off on all the details involved in the execution. 
and the other person who was more on the ground uh, as far as logistics was concerned, his name was uh, Major Lewis M. Bloomfield. So we, so we therefore got two Canadians, major players in the spy industry, who are heavily involved in the logistics in terms of the assassination of JFK. And uh, where was Stevenson spending most of his time? After, after the Second World War, he relocated uh, his, his uh, operations to Jamaica. Okay. What happened was, to set the table a little bit here, was the intelligence communities that were involved in the Second World War, after the Second World War was over, they got into what's called our cutouts, which are fronts for intelligence operations. Right. So Sir William set up his front in Jamaica. Right. And we know from many researchers who have confirmed this, that all the major players who were involved in the hit on JFK, they all assembled in, in, in Jamaica previous, just prior to the assassination. So what was the organization that he was associated with? That well, the, the, the big um, sort of brand that they used was called Permanent Industrial Expositions or more commonly known as Permindex. Now, if uh, all those people who have perhaps seen the movie on JFK and remember the scene with Kevin Costner as Jim Garrison asking Tommy Lee Jones as Clay Shaw if he knew anything about Centro Mundiale Commerciale, which is Italian for World Trade Center. Com uh, Centro Mundiale Commerciale was the was, was one arm of the Permindex web, which was run by the intelligence communities. Okay, so how does Bloomfield fit into that picture? Well, um, Major Louis Bloomfield was uh, born in Montreal and he was trained uh, in Palestine before Israeli independence by the British, who um, immediately um, trained him as an intellig intelligence officer. And he trained the Haganah, the uh, Jewish liberation groups, in, in all kinds of uh, warfare and intelligence prior to Israeli uh, independence. Uh, he went on from there to become a lawyer in Montreal where he had his own law firm. But he also became a major shareholder of Permindex. Okay. So he is a, a, as about as big as it gets in terms of Permindex and the whole running and operations of this CIA intelligence Machine. Do either of you believe the official story of the assassination of John Kennedy, which is that he was killed by a lone gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald? Well, the short answer is you don't believe anything. It, it doesn't hold together. Same thing as the 9-11 story, that, you know, the, if you base your, your, your decisions on hard evidence, uh, there's very little hard ev evidence that Oswald could have ever planned the hit. And by the way, he, the, the bullet that killed Kennedy could not have come from the Texas Book Depository. Uh, Oswell was never shown to have fired a gun that day in ballistic tests. Uh, he was never shown to have been standing at that window. Um, the only, the big thing that I always thought about this story was when they fingerprinted the, the seventh floor of the Texas Book Depository at that window, they found one thumbprint which belonged to a fellow by the name of Malcolm Wallace who was a well-known hitman for, for Johnson. So, Johnson being? Uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, who became the president immediately after Kennedy died. So obviously Johnson had a, had a motive. And uh, his, his, uh, his thug, the guy that's been known to have done some pretty dirty deeds for him in the past, his thumbprint was found on, on a cardboard box at that, si at that site. Oswald, there's no evidence that Oswald was ever standing there. Andrew, I'm sure you feel the same way, that the official story is. Well, um, even though I, at the very tender age of 13, as I was when it happened 50 years ago, um, I can't think of uh, one event other than 9-11 that's changed the world in the last 50 years. And certainly the official version uh, has, never, has never stood up to any kind of uh, critical analysis or deductive reasoning in terms of uh, how one man could orchestrate such a, an amazing, you know, uh, execution like that. So uh, the answer is uh, no, I've never accepted the official version. That's why there's been so much research into other versions. We'll see over the next month the way the media covers this story. I, I think they will, there will be no coverage of, the, of what Kennedy was really all about, which was perhaps a non-corporate world 
You know, he was, I think, an, a more independent president. He didn't want war. He wanted good relationships with the Soviet Union. I think he wanted what was good for the American people, not the American corporations. I think that's why he was killed. Let's watch the role of the media. But over the last 50 years, the media, the corporate media, the, the big media has never raised a single question, as far as I know, about the assassination. It's always the official version. And maybe you want to comment on... I will cop comment on that. It's called Operation Mockingbird. Operation Mockingbird was a plan uh, to infiltrate the media in the U.S. In other words, they needed stringers or reporters that would report the intelligence version of events, and he, would be, he or she would be fed information. Now, in the Second World War, when the British Security uh, Coordination Complex was set up in, in, in the States, their, main, their mandate from Churchill and the, and the United Kingdom and MI6 was to was convert the American public from being isolationist to interventionist. And how did they do that? They got people like Walter Winchell. Walter Winchell was a, a public commentator, gossip, columnist, you know, all, you know, roundabout man of the media. And they got Walter on the payroll, and he would plant stories about, you know, Germans, you know, arriving on the docks of New York, and we're all going to be terrorized any day now. And that, of course, those are all plants. Those are all stories that were planted by the intelligence community. So to answer your question, the media was taken over by the intelligence communities um, pretty well just right after the Second World War. I would also say that the media is owned, it has to be, by people who are sympathetic to, to the lies because the owners certainly have huge control over what goes into their media and it's like the truth never gets in. As we can recall again using the JFK movie as a template that everyone can relate to, we, we, we saw this man named Fletcher Prouty, who's an inside job kind of guy who's in New Zealand, and he sees the picture of Lee Harvey Oswald in the New Zealand papers on November 23rd. Now, one would, you know, before the digital age, before the whole, you know, immediate transmission of images across the world, you've got to ask yourself, how did this newspaper in New Zealand get a picture of Lee Harvey Oswald one day after the event? So obviously... They were, given him, they were given the picture of Lee Harvey Oswald before the actual and day of November 22nd. They gave him the official story. So there is the concrete evidence of the media and obviously being absorbed into this intelligence mission, which was to deceive you know, the public in terms of what actually happened. So the media was totally involved in that, both, uh, both internationally and nationally and domestically in Canada as well. Because the media in Canada was the one, uh, w w the, the, the Canadian spies that were recruited for the British intelligence in, in, the, in the States in the early 1940s were recruited through Canadian media. And they were, they were being advertised as secretaries for the Canadian, for the British passport office, which was totally untrue. They were actually, gonna, they were actually spies that were gonna be infiltrating the, uh, the American media, sending out false information to convert the Americans from being Interve sorry, from, from being isolationist to interventionist. And the Canadians, and this is why the Canadian connection on, in the hit of JFK is so important because they played a, a, a major role both in the logistics of the operations because Sir William Stevenson was the quarterback running everything from ground central, probably in Jamaica. And number two, Major Lewis Bloomfield was obviously, uh, you know, he was called the engineer. He's called the engineer of the whole hit. Uh, so obviously he was the one who was making sure that all the different groups carried out their tasks. Okay, so give us the details. Well, so the different, there were many different intelligence communities involved. The, we know that um, there was French intelligence because they, the, they, the, they were the marksmen, the special marksmen that had to be brought in. The, uh, the Israelis provided the logi logistics for the French intelligence in terms of how to do it and how to set up and when to do it. And the British intelligence was obviously involved in uh, other, other areas. And Canadian intelligence, they were heavily involved because two of the people from Canadian intelligence were major players and decision makers in the whole event. So Canada has a, has a real stamp on that event. And unfortunately, uh, this particular information has never been revealed until now. You mentioned earlier when we were talking uh, something called DISC. DISC, yes. Uh, Defense Industrial Security Command. Um, when the intelligence communities went 
underground, for lack of a better term, after the Second World War. Uh, what happened was they set up Permindex as the official business cover. But they also, uh, so as that business cover, they had uh, other uh, identities as well. And one of the identities was Division 5 of the Defense Industrial Security oh, Command, right, right, right. which was set up by the FBI, which is, which is Hoover. I remember now, you mentioned some of the names of people now, the, who were the, the involved. Members, so uh, DISC, uh, DISC was run by uh, Hoover, the head of the FBI, and uh, his assistant Sullivan. But the, the members of DISC are very famous names associated with the JFK hit, um, namely Clay Shaw, okay. uh, Bannister, David Ferry, Lee Harvey Oswald, and Jack Ruby. They were all members of now, DISC. Now, from the movie JFK, which Walter and I saw together a long time ago, I mean, the names that Andrew just mentioned are like the main players in the assassination of, of, of John Kennedy. And you're saying that these same people were in a secret FBI unit. That's correct, DISC. And DISC was part of, it was, it was, it was called Division 5, and the members were all members of DISC. And that, was, uh, and that was the intelligence communities going underground within the business cutout they set up. In other words, Permindex um, slash Centro Mundiale Commerciale had uh, intelligence branches and the major branch, which was part of the branch that was in charge of the JFK hit, was, uh, was DISC. And of course, um, Major Bloomfield was probably the chief. He was, the, he was probably the head of DISC. So Bloomfield was probably supervising Ferry, Oswald, Ruby, Shaw, and Bannister. So there's a connection right there. It's a very there's a connection as well. Very as, firm. And because Clay Shaw, um, he's not Canadian, he's American. But uh, again, using the JFK movie as the template for everyone to relate to, uh, by Tommy Lee Jones, he was the guy who was set up the International Trademark in New Orleans. Now, the International Trademark is part of Permindex. And what do we know about JFK coming to Dallas? Well, here's the, here's the connection. JFK was invited to Dallas on November 22nd, 1963, to open up the Dallas Trademark. Now, the Dallas Trademark is linked to the International Trademark in New Orleans, which is part of the Permindex web, which was set up by the intelligence communities after the Second World War. So that's how they drew Kennedy into Dallas. So in order to draw him there, yeah. they, the Permindex said, we got, to, we got to invite him to Dallas to open up the Dallas Trademark. And that's why in da and JFK, on his way through Dealey Plaza, was on his way to the luncheon at the at the Dallas Trademark, yeah, and there's still there still is a building in, in in Dallas, I believe, called the Dallas Trademark. There certainly is a huge building in New Orleans which you can find the International Trademark there. So yeah. we have the Permindex connections both in New Orleans and in Dallas, as well as Montreal, which was really the mother ship for both New Orleans and Dallas. I was going to ask you, what, what do you think? Um, so you know, you have this elite spy network that you now bridged across from Israel, France, England, United Kingdom, Canada, United and States. The, and, the, and the Italian Mafia as well, the Corsican Mafia. The Italian Mafia, mafia in the United States. So do you think you know, there's a, does this show that there's sort of a, a, a worldwide sort of intelligence network, an elite network that would even bridge uh, across to the Soviet Union, to China, and to uh, Pakistan and Southeast Asia. Do you think there's a, an elite kind of a intelligence organization worldwide? Well, there is because um, Sir, Sir William Stevenson was the, the guy running it. Now, if, if you remember the raid on Entebbe in 1976 in Uganda, yeah. uh, Sir William Stevenson was still alive then, and he, he was well involved in the, plan in the planning and the logistics, logistics, logistics yeah. of that operation. The story of the Cold War and the, the nuclear arms build up and all that, it, it never held, uh, held water for me. I always thought that that was another fake story. And, and, uh, and you know, I think you lent me the book Spy Catcher. Remember uh, Peter Wright, the uh, ex-British uh, intelligence opera, uh, officer that wrote the book Sky 
flycatcher, and he was trying to find the fifth man in the group in um, the Philby Burgess crowd in the Pointing 50s. Us. And I always stuck in reading that book and, and thinking about it that uh, the major role the British were playing at that time was funneling uh, the military secrets and, 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 and plans and how to build nuclear weapons from the United States to the Soviet Union. And it was just like a daily occurrence that they were funneling all this information to the point where I thought, well, maybe that was the plan, that, that, that they played that role in keeping the Russians up to speed on the American technology because the Americans would build a weapon and a couple of years later the Russians would have it. Like, it was just like clockwork. And if you actually look at the schedule of all the weapons, there's eight or 10 of them that happened that way where the Americans developed it, the Russians had it very soon afterwards and the arms race kept going to know it made no sense militarily because you couldn't use them <laughs> because the world would be over. And I always thought that, that the global intelligence network was playing a role in, in that. What would you think of that analysis? Well, I would agree, I would agree with you, Walt. Uh, I think that the global intelligence community is, uh, it has its, fin has its uh, footprint uh, basically yeah. everywhere in the world. Uh, there are multinational operations uh, running concurrently in so many parts of the world, uh, it would be frightening to even think yeah. about them. And, uh, as, a, and as, as I suggest, after the Second World War, that's when the fusion of all the different individual agencies combined, uh, which obviously led in 1963 to the hit on JFK. So you could imagine 50 years later, they even work, you know, there's probably more cooperation amongst all of them uh, globally than one, one would imagine. And as the point I try to make is, um, the, the global intelligence complex is totally out of control. There's no monitoring, there's no transparency, there's no accountability, there's no idea of budgets that are being spent. Um, they're called black budgets. In other words, for reasons of national security, we cannot reveal what our communications intelligence is spending, or our signals intelligence, or our human intelligence. That's all, that's all classified and no one is allowed to, to reveal it. So that's why I think that the Bloomfield Archives, which are the archives of Major Lewis Bloomfield, which are held by the Library and Archives Canada, should be available um, for, for public viewing. Um, a researcher in Montreal applied in, to, in 2004 because uh, uh, Lewis Bloomfield requested a 20-year uh, moratorium on the opening of the files. But uh, when researchers tried to open them after the 20-year uh, a period that ended, they were not allowed to access the files. And in those files would be a lot of secrets and information that would lead to a lot of, um, you know, new stories and new ideas of what really happened. Are they electronic to be kept or are they paper? Uh, I think it's mostly mostly paper. Yeah. Mostly paper. But it is available. You can see what, what what's in the files online. Wow. Library and Archives Canada. Very interesting. But the, you know, but the point is, again, uh, the, the Canadian role in this is unknown. Um, as, as we've heard today, the BC Civil Liberties Union is, uh, has fi filed a suit against the Canadian Security Intelligence Complex uh, for you know, invasion of privacy and violating the Charter of Rights. So it's really, yeah. by highlighting what happened in the JFK uh, incident, really brings to, to, to the forefront how we must get the intelligence community, both in Canada and the world, under control, under monitoring, under surveillance, under some sort of transparency because they are, they have been out of control for 50 years yeah. or more. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we're out of time. Andrew, thank you so much for doing it. Um, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, one of the uh, most tragic events, certainly of, of the last, cent uh, you know, a, a disaster for everybody. Walter, thank you very much. Always a Thanks pleasure. for watching this segment of the Citizens Forum.